final step is to show that the overall selectivity is the smaller of the two. Why is that? Can someone argue this for me? So I'll give you a concrete example here. Suppose I have a column one, column two. And my column one, let's assume I have two distinct values. Uh, let's say they are B and C. Okay. For my column two, I have three distinct values. Suppose they are A, B, and C. Okay. Of course, each column I assume uniform distribution.
So you cannot even perform that argument. Do you follow this argument? So yes, there are two possible rewritings of this query, but only one of them actually will work because the other table doesn't even have the values the other table has. For example, I don't even have an A, so you cannot even rewrite like that. That's why the overall selectivity is one over the max of the DC number keys of the two tables. Okay? So that's that. I will continue the discussion. Next, we will talk about uh, there are uh, Next, we will talk about how we estimate selectivity for the case when we do not have uniform distribution. What if we don't have uniform distribution? What do we do? So far, you know, if you think about all the discussion we have so far, it is based off essentially this function column equal to value and assume uniform. Distribution of value, then we argue that the reduction factor of selectivity is simply 1 over n. n is the DC number of keys on that value column, right? So far, all the discussion we have, no matter if it's a range query or point query or column 1 equal column 2, are all generated based on this simple operation, right? Based on this simple operation. Which require a really strong assumption, which is assuming uniform distribution on a given column. We all know that's not the case. For example, look at your GPA distribution of all students in Utah. Clearly, that doesn't follow a uniform distribution. And if you look at the age distribution of students in Utah, again, that doesn't necessarily follow a uniform distribution. So what to do in the general case? To give you an example, for example, uh, I can draw a distribution like that, which I did towards the end of last lecture. So this is the value. Uh, this is their frequency. Uh, I may have a, a picture like this, something like that. Right? This is our possible value, this is our frequency of those values uh, that appear in my database. We follow this graph. And I believe this is roughly, if you, if you connect these dots, it's kind of like what? Like a normal distribution. Somewhat like a normal distribution, but not strictly a normal distribution. First of all, do you know what is a normal distribution? Can someone explain to me what is a normal distribution? How do you describe a normal distribution? How many parameters do you need to describe a normal distribution? Two. two. Who said two? Okay, I want somebody else to answer this one. Two is the right answer. Yes, go ahead. To this one, normal distribution, you need mean and a variance, or in other way, a standard deviation, which essentially are the same thing. But this doesn't. This looks like a normal distribution, but doesn't really look like a normal distribution. So, a naive solution: if I want to estimate what's the reduction factor of column equal to value with respect to this value. If you use uniform distribution assumption, clearly you're going to be off. Right? Clearly you're going to be off. So how do you solve this problem? The naive solution is, I just remember this distribution. I just remember this distribution. Example, 5, 6, 10, 11, 11, 9, 6 again, 5. So in total, I have what? I have 20, 30, uh, 47, 57, uh, 68. So my total count is 68 in this case. If you ask me, I suppose this is you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If you ask me what's the 
reduction factor of this equal to 9, the selectivity is simply 5 over 68. Right? That makes sense? If I change this to a value equal to 5, then this becomes 11 out of 68. But if you use uniform distribution, it's always 1 over 9. Clearly, uh, uh, there is a big difference of these two values. So naive solution is to remember all, all these uh, frequency distributions. But what's the cost of doing that? The cost of doing that is order where n is a distinct number of keys you have. You have to spend this much cost. Versus the naive solution using uniform distribution, what's your cost? Using uniform distribution, what's your cost of estimating reduction factor? It's order y. It's constant, right? You just remember a single value, which is the distinct number of keys you have. So clearly there's a difference, right? Huge difference. If I have millions, millions of values, you are talking about constant time versus a time that's linear to the order of millions. So there's a huge difference. Okay? The question is, is there something in between? If you think about this solution, this solution is the most efficient solution. You cannot beat constant, come on, right? There's no way you can beat constant. But quality-wise, this is the worst. It gives you the least quality guarantee. This, on the other hand, gives you the best quality as you can think of because it gives you the exact solution. But it's as expensive as it can be. Is there something in between that explore the trade-off between the cost and the quality. That's essentially what we'll be discussing now. Yes? Couldn't you though, I guess, if you wanted even to keep like 100% accurate histogram, do like a uh, bit tree or something, wouldn't that say? Bit tree is still linear cost. Yeah. So it, it doesn't really give you any savings. Yeah. It actually adds additional overhead because mm -hmm. indexing adds additional space overhead. But no, there? Yeah, so can you just do it by quantity? Yes, that's one of the choices. But for that, you're losing accuracy for uh, space settings, which I will talk about next. Okay. So, to explore something in between, of course there are many choices you can have. One choice is what we call equal width histogram. And this is actually the notion of histogram. This is the general notion of this one. For example, what I would do, if you look at this picture here, to summarize this picture, you can actually do better, which is to argue, okay, 5 and 6 is roughly what? 5.5. That okay? So I will group these two together, and I will group these guys together, and I will group these guys together. So I remember only three values instead of nine values in total. I will argue anyone fall into the first bucket, I will estimate their frequency to be 5.5. Anyone fall into the second bucket, I will estimate their frequency to be what? To be 10. Anyone fall into the last bucket, I will estimate their frequency to be 5. So I have only three values, essentially which is more expensive than remembering a single value, but it's much better than remembering n values. Of course, in this case, n is a small number, n equals 9, but I can make the example arbitrarily, the contrary to be arbitrarily big, right? I can insert many other frequency values here, and this trick may still work. And this is essentially what we call histogram. And there are many different ways of building such histograms. One choice is to say, you know, I got a, regardless of the distribution, this, uh, if you look at what I just did, is distribution aware, right? I, when I draw the boundary like that, why don't you... Another way of drawing this bucket is, I can also do this. I can also say, I'm gonna group this three together, and this three together, 
and this one together. I can also do that. But this obviously is not as optimal as the first solution I have proposed. Why? Because this too is OK. We think the bucket is pretty uniform distribution. But for the first one, what happens? You have a huge variance with respect to the distribution within the first bucket. Whenever you have a huge variance within a single bucket, and you use a single value to approximate the frequency of everyone in that bucket, you're going to have large errors with respect to that bucket. But this, this second approach does have an advantage, which is it's fairly simple. I group every three or every x item together, no matter what your distribution looks like. So very simple. For example, to estimate your GPA, instead of remember GPA of every student, I would say every four of them, I calculate an average. Every four of them, I calculate an average. I don't really care what are the GPA of these four students. If they are fairly uniform, for example, all four of them are A, then fantastic, I got no error. But if they have A, B, C, and D, if I group them, calculate average, then my variance is pretty bad. But however, it's very, really simple. I don't even have to ask you what is your GPA. I don't even have to understand the distribution. I just say every four of them group together. And that's essentially the first idea called equal weights. Equal weights is exactly what I said, which is you look at your frequency distribution, and you say every x of them go to a bucket. Then I use the average of those atoms in a bucket, the frequency average, as the estimation for any atom frequency fall within that bucket. So that's equal weights. Is that clear? Example. This is essentially the equal weights histogram. The equal depths. Histogram says, so let me actually give you a, a, a idea of what equal width looks like. For example, this is equal width histogram, which says, you know, in the value domain, every 10 values are going to group together. I'm going to maintain, for example, my, suppose my job at the moment is to estimate the count, the number of values within a given range. Suppose that's what I want to do. So equal width says I'm going to group every so many values together and count how many uh, database records having values in this range. For example, this simply tells you in my database, with respect to this column, there are two values between 0 and 0.99 and three values between 1 and 1.99 and three values between 2 and 2.9 and so on and so forth, and there are a values between 4 and 4.9 so on and so forth. Does that make sense? If you look at the way I produce this bar kit, I do an equal partition on my value domain, regardless of the actual distribution in my database on those values. So that's what it ends up looking like. Do you follow this argument? Okay, that's equal width. What about, if you have equal width, you must have equal depths. Equal depth is what I showed on the right, which is if you have, okay, equal width is really good if you have more or less <coughs> uniform distribution, then this actually works really well. But equal width become really bad if I have really skewed distributions. If I have skewed distribution, this actually doesn't work so well. Why is that? For example, you know, if you think about it, if your query condition aligns perfectly with the bar case you have, then this actually works pretty well. For example, tell me the value, how many values I have between 20 and 30. I can answer that exactly because that's exactly this count. Right? What about tell me the number of values between 10 and 30? That's fairly easy as well. I can just add up this too. What about the reduction factor? Well, that's even that's a trivial step afterwards, right? You add, add up the total count, then divide by the total count over all buckets. That gives you the reduction factor for value between 10 and 30. Yes? But this calculation breaks down if I ask you, like, what's the reduction factor for
15 and 25. So I'm asking something like from here to here. How many value are there in this range? Can someone tell me? You don't know. Let me actually uh, example, you know, my, you know, zoom into this case. That's what it looks like. Suppose this is five. Meaning, I have five values between 10 and 20, and I have 10 values between 20 and 30. If you ask me the reduction factor for uh, 10 and 30, suppose this is an x, that's easy, right? That's 15 divided by the total count. I can get the total count by summing up the markets, all markets. That's easy. And this is, a, this is a, the answer. But if I change this to x, uh, how do you estimate this? Total count stays the same, right? It's a constant. How do you estimate this question mark? I mean, you can just assume that within the buckets it's uniform. You have to, right? Yeah. You, you have to assume, because you know nothing about this market anymore. <coughs> That's the whole point. If you want to remember details within the market, it degenerates to that linear cost solution. You are remembering the exact distributions, which is what you are trying to avoid. So you know nothing about this market, so you can only assume what? Uniform distribution within the market. Which means I'm going to estimate this value, so the actual value in the database will spread out within a market uniformly. So that if you ask this, then from 15 to 20, what's the reduction factor of this? That's like selecting half of your market, so it's half times five. Because there are five total elements here, you are selecting half the market. Assuming uniform distribution, you are selecting half of them, roughly. And then from 20 to 25, what do you do? Huh? Again, you are selecting roughly half of the market, so it's roughly what? Times? Huh? Times one. Times ten. Huh? So you, you estimate the total is half times five plus half times ten. You, you estimate your reaction factor. Of course, if the true distribution follow what you what you are saying, which is uniform, then this works perfectly. But unfortunately, it may not be right. It may not follow the uniform distribution. For example, in the extreme case, I could have your market looks like this, but my real frequency distribution may look like this. There is no value equal to 5, and there are 5 values equal to 11, so there are all the other values are 0, essentially. Because if there are 5 values equal to 11, which must mean there are no other values in this market, because the total frequency is 5. Here, similarly, I can have maybe 21 has maybe value of 1, then all of that are 0, then I have maybe something like this. Like 28, 20, uh, 20, 27, 28, 29, each of these is value of 3, so add up total, this part is 10. But uh, assuming uniform distribution, obviously you're, you're going to be off a lot. So the true reduction factor in this case, if it's like that, the true reduction factor is 1 over total count. Instead of this over total count. So you're going to be off by a huge margin. Do you see the problem? Yeah? Yes? So this motivates people to design a different history map. A different history map. So the next history map people come up with and say, OK, equal width is bad for these cases when you no longer have uniform distribution within a market. What I will do is I'm going to assume uh, I'm going to do equal depths to address this problem. The argument is, in some sense, you don't have the, 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 the root cause of the problem is you do not have uniform distribution within a market. 
So I'm going to try to eliminate uh, such cases as much as I can. So one possible attempt is to argue, okay, instead of you know, making this bracket of different heights, I'm going to make sure all brackets are equal heights. Of course, this means that you can no longer guarantee you have same number of key values in a bracket. Because each value may have different number of frequencies, right? If you want to make sure each bracket has the same frequency, each bracket may stretch out to cover different number of values. For example, you have a really frequent value, that may be by itself a bracket in itself. Then another bracket may cover a large range of values, every one of them is very infrequent, so the total count add up to be just equal to that one single value that's very frequent. So you end up with a bracketization like the one on the right. Each bracket has the same number of total frequencies, but each bracket now may cover different number of values for that reason. Then, and this is what we call equal depths histogram. You follow this? How would you build an equal depth histogram? Well, again, this is fairly easy to build. You do a linear scan over your database, and you obtain that total count. That's easy, right? Total number of records you have. Then you do a line sweeping from left to right of your values, okay, assuming you sort your record by the value. Then you do a line sweeping from left to right, maintain an incremental counter. If the counter equal to, suppose that, and the parameter is B, let's say, or, or M. M is the number of buckets uh, you try to build. Suppose I use M to be known the number of buckets you try to build. Then you do a line sweeping from left to right, and whenever you have total count divided by M number of records you have encountered, that's one bucket. Continue build the next bucket, and so on and so forth. So it's a linear uh, cost algorithm. Assuming, of course, records are already sorted by their values, you just do a line sweeping from left to right. You follow this? So it's very easy to build. But does this really solve our problem? Does equal depths histogram address this problem? What Dylan has mentioned. Or you just assume you don't do building a work. Do you suffer from the same challenge? Huh? Um, I mean, it seems like it has the identical problem because you can still end up with like all yeah. of it like 10 or something. I guess though, then you do know if like a sudden jump occurs, it will prop, or something's more likely to be at the end. So Maybe you still that. suffer, exactly, you still suffer the same problem. For example, I can say, okay, so from 10 to 5, so from 20 to 30, I have a total of frequency of 10. So 1 here and, you know, uh, 27, 28, 29, and this is 30, and all the other values are 0. 21 has a value of 1, so the total frequency is 10. So here, I have total frequency of 5. Fine. I'm going to extend this to cover from 0 to 20, let's say, such that my total frequency become 10 as well. Why? Because maybe 11 has a value of 5, and the other between 10 and 20 are uh, a value of 0, frequency of 0, but they have another one from 1 to 10. I can have a total of 5 uh, occurrence somewhere. Let's say 1 has a value of 2, and I need 5 of them. Right? So 0, 0, 0, then maybe 5 has a value of 2, and 9 has a value of 1. The other are 0. So that if you add up the total, this is 5, this is 2, this is 2, this is 1, the total is 10. Right? So this is a perfectly uh, valid equal depths histogram. Yet, if I do a query like this, you, the same challenge uh, still persists. You are, you, you are still subject to the same challenge. So equal depths, neither equal width nor equal depth solve your problem. Do you follow this argument? So none of this works, so can we do better? So, 
this is a, this is a, there is an example of equal depths on uh, histogram. So motivated by these observations, uh, people designed the uh, the well-known algorithm called uh, V optimal histogram. This actually is the common histogram database engine nowadays used. The idea is essentially to capture exactly what Dylan said, which is so far we've been saying, okay, we, we have to assume the uniform distribution within a market. What about while we build these markets, we attempt to build market in such a way such that within each market it's as uniform as it can be. It is as uniform as it can be. For example, if my market look, if my frequency distribution looks like this, what I would do? What I would do? I will try to make each market within market as uniform as possible, so that I will, if that's the case, I will group the first one, first two into a market, and the next four into a market, and the next three into a market. Why I do that? Intuitively, within each market, it's more or less like a uniform distribution. And when I do this, once I have finished building this market, I can safely ignore or throw away the exact frequency of those values and still be safe when I assume uniform distribution, when I do things like that. Because each market is as almost as it's almost as a uniform distribution. It may not necessarily be exactly a uniform distribution, but will be really close to a uniform distribution. Does that make sense? That's the intuition behind this, this algorithm. But the question is, how do you formalize this notion that something is really similar or as close as it can be to a uniform distribution? This brings up the question is, how do you capture that something is a uniform distribution? And what's the distinct property of a uniform distribution? If you think about our argument for the, uh, you know, when we define normal distribution, people use two things, right? One is what? Standard dimension. Uh, one is mean, the other is variance. So variance is a big deal in quantifying the property of a distribution. For example, I can have two cities, Salt Lake City and New York. And see the average income for Salt Lake City is $5,000 per month. Okay? And average income for New York City is also $5,000 per month. Can you just look at these two values and claim, okay, Salt Lake City people and New York City people live alike? Obviously, we don't, of course, if you are from Mars, you don't know what Salt Lake and New York are, you will say, yeah, they should be uh, living alive. But if you are from the US, you know clearly there is a difference. Why is that? Because average is really not a good way to characterize distribution, right? People in New York have an average income of $5,000. That's maybe because many of them are making low income, but there are 1% of people making <coughs> over, I don't know, $100,000 per month. And that, you know, aggregate, when you aggregate up together, then the average still becomes 5000 And people in Salt Lake make average $5,000 per month, that's because everybody makes roughly $5,000 a month in Salt Lake. Of course, that's not true. Even Salt Lake, you have some kind of distribution, but the, the variance is much smaller in Salt Lake than it is in New York. So this shows an important thing to characterize distribution, which is you need to look at variance. First of all, can someone tell me what is virus? Given a distribution, how do you calculate its virus? Huh? And the CS master students, you guys know what virus is. <laughs> you 
if you don't know, fine, I will define this for you. Yeah, go ahead. Is it the, uh, uh, I can't remember if it's a, well, the standard deviation is a little bit square root, but this. Standard deviation is just a square root of yeah. part. So, so you're going to have one with that one. The sum of squares of the, sum the difference square. between each particular value and the mean. Excellent. The variance is simply the sum of the square for the difference between each individual value of your distribution to its mean, to the mean of the distribution. In other words, so first of all, what's a distribution? First of all, we need to understand, let's assume we're talking about discrete domains. Discrete domains that you have limited number of choices, possible choices for your value to take. So a distribution quantifies the probability for a value to take a particular, uh, for the variable, for the random variable to take a particular value. So for example, probability x equal to x1, probability of x equal to x2, p1 equal to p2, and all the way to probability of x equal to xn. Suppose I can take n distinct values. This form of distribution, if and only if, what? When does this form of proper distribution? Huh? When does this form of distribution? When the summation of the probability equal to one. When you have enumerated all possible cases, it becomes a distribution. Otherwise, it is not a distribution. For example, I ask you, what's the distribution of Salt Lake City weather? You cannot tell me, oh, the distribution is sunny day is 80%. That's not a distribution. That only tells me one possible choice. What, what's the other 20%? You cannot tell me, for example, if I tell you Salt Lake City has 90% of sunny days, you say, oh, I want to move there. Wait a minute. If I tell you the other 10% is that all the bad things can think of. Earthquake. And not only earthquake, impact of whole grid and higher earthquake. Would you want to be living there? I don't want to be there. Even with 10% chance, I don't want to be there. Even 1% chance, I don't want to be there. Right, so you have to tell me the whole distribution in order for me to make a decision. You cannot tell me, oh, 90% of the days is sunny, and the other 10% of the days is like minus 40 degree and earthquake and all the bad things. I don't want to do that. So you have to tell me the full distribution. So this becomes a distribution only if uh, some issue of the probability becomes one. Now, if this is the distribution, what's the variance of this? Like Dylan has said, variance of this x simply the summation of 1 to n of xi uh, minus x bar, where x bar is basically summation of xi divided by n, the, the mean. Okay? So that's uh, uh, how you define the variance. A variance is also written as this. The standard deviation is simply the square root of this. Okay? So as a computer science student, right, you should know this. If you want to do anything with data analytics, you have to understand what's a distribution, what's a variance, what's, you know, these are fairly basic stuff. Now that being said, if this is a uniform distribution, if, if this is a uniform distribution, what can you claim about the variance? Z. <coughs> huh? It's very small. Z. Pretty small. Good, but not good enough. It's a, if it's perfectly uniform, there would be no variance, right? No, there is a variance, but variance is zero. Okay. Zero is, there's a difference between no variance and, no variance means it's, it's not well defined. It is well defined. The variance is simply zero. So if it's a uniform distribution, variance will simply equal zero. So it's not only small, that's good, but not good enough, it's like as small as it can be, it's zero. There's no variance because each value, will, if it's a uniform distribution, if it's a uniform, then you will have this observation that any value will simply equal to uh, the, the average. So this gives us the motivation to define this bucket, which is how do you make sure within bucket is almost like a uniform distribution? What's the intuition? Well, the variance within each bucket should be as small as possible. When that happens, you get a roughly uniform distribution. Okay, how do you do that? Well, I don't want to go into detail, but basically, suppose I have n number of markets, 
and I denote the ice bucket using bi. So bi denotes the ice bucket. So for example, this is b1, b2, b3. In this case, I have three buckets. So what I will do is, for each value in a bucket, I look at the frequency of that value minus the representation, which is the total count divided by total number of values in that bucket, which is I'm, I'm simply using the average frequency of that bucket to represent that bucket, which is the height of this bucket. So I'm looking at the difference between each value and the average count of this bucket. And square root of that, that defines the variance of this bucket, of single bucket. Then sum over all the bucket, that gives me the total variance over all the buckets I have. And my objective is what? Is to minimize this. Subject to something, it must be subject to something, right? If you don't have a condition, what's the optimal solution to this? Uh, each value be a bucket by itself, then my variance is zero. Because that simply becomes Fv minus Fv, so everything is zero, right? So it must be subject to something. But, but if you do that, that becomes exactly the, the linear solution we talked about. And that explains why the linear solution is good, because the variance is zero. There are no bars. Okay? Subject to something, subject to a constraint, which is what's the cost you are willing to pay? How do we quantify the cost indexes? Number of buckets. The more buckets you have, the more costly it becomes. The less number of buckets you have, the less costly it is. Subject to the number of buckets you have. So now this becomes a well defined problem, which is. For example, I gave you 100 buckets to use. How do you find 100 buckets such that uh, this become minimized over uh, the domain of the values you are interested in? How do you solve this problem? Well, that's another issue. I don't want to spend another that to explain that. I probably need another 20 minutes also, so I will skip that. I'll give you a hint. You can use dynamic programming to do this. Uh, the specific formulation of it, uh, I will leave for you to think about. Okay? And it's a simple dynamic programming formulation. Okay, so it's not, it's not too bad. And what about, so this is one dimension, right? What about extending this to two dimensions? In two dimensions, this becomes, instead of finding this set of buckets, you are trying to find a set of squares, rectangles to cover your space. So in two dimensions, this problem becomes So a point in two dimension means what's the frequency of a record having x equal to a particular value a and y equal to a particular value b? Right? And I, can, I have many such points all over the place. And can you approximate this? The question is can you design a bunch of parties to cover that, to cover the whole space? Such that within each bucket, the frequency distribution is roughly a uniform distribution, which means that you minimize the variance in each bucket. In two dimensions, this becomes way harder. It's not even a dynamic programming problem. In fact, in two dimensions, if you don't constrain the type of box you have, I can have a rectangle box. I can also have a box like this, right? Maybe I can have a box like that, like Tetris. And this becomes actually a PR. Just jumping up one dimension, it becomes a PR. But if I limit to regular rectangular box, then this problem is still solvable. Uh, but much harder than just a dynamic program. I don't want to go into detail of that. Uh, again, I'm not, that's the exact solution. If you want to build an approximate version of this, uh, you are actually hopeful. You can do an approximate. Uh, covering of your space such that approximately each bucket minimizes the virus uh, within the bucket. Okay? Now within this, now if I ask you to ask me selected of this, you can use the trick we said earlier, which is you break up this within, within that bucket you have. If it completely covers the bucket, you simply use the total count from the bucket. If we partially cover, meaning overlap with the market, you calculate the overlapping area as a percentage, then multiply the total count of the market as a selectivity estimation for that market. Because you are essentially now 
you can safely assume uniform distribution within each market. Because that's how you construct this market in the first place. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so that's the idea. Okay, uh, that's enough discussion on history graphs, and in your product four, you are required to implement a version of history graph. I forgot which version I asked you to implement, but it's not as complicated as this uh, variance optimal. By the way, it's called V optimal history graph because it's variance optimal. V stands for variance. Variance optimal history graph. First, I didn't ask you to implement this in lab four because in order for you to implement this, you need to figure out how to solve that minimization optimization problem using a dynamic programming. But if you're interested, definitely give it a time to right? see if can you solve that using dynamic programming. Uh, yes? So I guess it's like pretty straightforward for most of the like I don't want to go into detail that, right? but I don't have lecture time for it. But if you well, I was wondering that, like, how do you update, like keep these things up to date? Assuming up to date. Uh, again, I will be more than happy to talk to you offline. Okay. I don't want to use we're a little bit shorter on time, so I will continue on. But I'll be happy to take on those discussions in my office. Now, what about uh, joint uh, over to table? How do you estimate? So somebody posed a question on um, Canvas and later deleted that thread, which is, what's the reduction factor of joint? Well, the reduction factor for joint is actually not really well defined, uh, unless you define the reduction factor of joint as the size of the joint divided by the size of the cross current. That's one way of defining it. Uh, typically, people don't say what's the reduction factor of the joint. People just say what's the size of the joint output. Just estimating the size. Because what to divide it by is not, uh, it's not something that's as intuitive as if it's a selection query over a single table. Okay. So, the idea is basically to carry out what we said earlier. A joint essentially is something like this. It's column one equal to column two, right? Column one equal to column two. So the way I'm going to argue this is as follows. Again, I'm going to assume uniform distribution. I'm going to assume uniform distribution. Now, I have two ways of looking at this. One is Join is like using the record of R probe into all the record in S. Let's suppose I'm doing a join between R and S. Another way of looking at it is using the record of S probing into the record of R. There are two kind of ways of rewriting this join query, right? If I do uh, the first approach, which is using the record from R probe into the table S, what do I get? Essentially, this is what I get for each tuple in R, for each tuple in R, what do I get? Assuming uniform distribution on S, I'm going to match up with roughly this number of records in S, which is total number of tuples in S divided by distinct number of keys in S. Assuming uniform distribution on the joint column, of course. You follow me? Assuming uniform distribution on the joint key, each record in R will match with roughly this number of records in S. Put the number of record in S divided by distinct number of keys in S. And that's essentially giving me an estimation for the joint size. Of course, I can also do it the other way, which is total number of tuple in S, and for each record I probe into R, which is which will give me roughly this number of matches, which is total number of record in, in R divided by distinct number of uh, uh, values in R on the joint column. And you take the smaller of the two estimation. What, why is that? Well, that goes back to the very early example I gave you in the beginning of the class. Uh, it's an overestimate because some values do not exist. So you take the, the smaller estimation of the two. OK? So that's the joint estimation. You may wonder, what if you don't have this uniform distribution assumption? If you have histogram, you still can do this. Instead of simply using total number of records multiply the average number of records from the other table. You, for each record, you look at the, the value of its drawn column, probe into the histogram of the other table to get an estimation of that. You sum up all this, you can get a, a, a more accurate estimation for the drawn size. 
for two tables. What about for multiple tables? That becomes a super hard problem. Uh, we just recently solved that problem. Uh, I'm sure you actually is the author of that paper. If you're interested, you can look at that. But it's a, I don't want to go into, uh, into depth of so that. That takes another whole lecture if we want to explain the details of that. For two tables, it's, it's relatively straightforward if you assume you have a histogram. But for multiple tables, it, it becomes really, really hard. And especially for drawing with triangles. And what's an example of that? On Facebook, Facebook always are interested in finding out triangles. What's a triangle? A is a friend of B, B is a friend of C. I'm interested to see whether C is a friend of A or not. Meaning that if friendship has any sort of correlation, if, I, if it do, if it, does, if it does, I will make recommendation. I will rec For example, if A is a friend of B, B is a friend of C, I'm most likely Facebook will recommend C as a friend to A. I want to find also triangles. That's a joint. But counting the number of triangles in a graph is really, really hard. It's not that easy. Okay? All right. Uh, let's move on now. Let's let's quickly pause for a little bit. We started with square optimization, and what we said is square optimization is to take a given input plan and generate equivalent plans. And for each equivalent plan you generate, <coughs> you're going to estimate the cost of that. And we focus on left deep tree, and it boils down to size <coughs> estimation for intermediate results. And size estimation for intermediate results reduced to reduction factor estimation, selectivity estimation. And we solve that problem. So we go all the way to reduce the problem to that, and we solve that. Now we go back up again, which is to argue, okay, now we know all the little details, how we combine all this discussion together to generate this, this overall query optimization algorithm, generate this overall query optimization Okay, that's what I want to do next. As we said, we're gonna, you know, this, these are some uh, examples and uh, I will skip this, you can, you can read through this yourself, some specific example. But the argument is for the general joint for we're going to focus on left deep tree joint. So we ignore all of this. So as you can tell, this, this already implies that the plan you get is not going to be the global optimal. Because maybe your global optimal plan is somewhere here, but you pull away those search space altogether. You didn't even look at that. How can you be sure you can find the global optimal? But that's fine. Uh, we, even if you focus just here, you will be able to find some good enough plans. But even in this space, as we argued, the plan space is at least is, is already greater equal than greater than or equal to n factorial. If I just permute the relations in the leaf level, I already got n factorial combinations, and the actual number of plans, even in the left leaf tree plan space, is way more than that because I can have different of combination of pushing down and different combination of joint algorithm and so on and so forth, right? So it's way more than n factorial. Obviously, what that tells you is you cannot afford, even if you limit yourself to this space, you still cannot afford to enumerate all possible plans. Why? Right? Because n factorial is in the order of, a, is an exponential order. So if you, if you try to enumerate all possible plans, even if you just limit yourself to a uh, left free plan space, you still end up with an exponential cost. Does that make sense? So you cannot do that. So what do we do? So this is essentially the algorithm that people use. Okay. What we do is, is okay, this is a heuristic. This is a heuristic. And what people do is, is a it's a greedy algorithm that proceeds in round, and each round I keep only the local optimal plan. That's essentially the idea of the, of, the, of the story. Actually, by saying this, I can actually conclude the lecture and ask you guys to figure out the details. I mean, you are a CS master student, right? <laughs> so if I say, oh, okay, the algorithm is uh, find the local, uh, it's a greedy algorithm, find the local optimal and proceed in round. I think that should be sufficient. But I will, of course, give you, a, if I see that, you will give me a bad evaluation score. So, so to avoid that, I will give you more details. Okay? But actually, in reality, that should be sufficient. If you work in Google, Facebook, 
your manager will tell you just that. And you, will, you, you need to be able to fill the missing pieces. If otherwise, why they hire you? Right? <laughs> if you think about it. Right? OK, so what's the missing piece? That's the generic idea, or what's the missing piece? The uh, missing piece is as follows. You proceed in round. You proceed in round. And the round, if you, if you allow me to backtrack to this left deep tree plan, what's a natural round in this case? Well, if you think about it, it's really, OK, it's a, it's a greedy algorithm to find local optimal. What's the local optimal? Local optimal is to find what's the best algorithm at the bottom level to join two tables. But the best algorithm or best plan to join two tables at base level may not lead to your global optimal for the left deep tree plan, but fine. I accept that fact. In order to avoid that any factorial cost, that's what I have to do. Instead of searching for the global optimal, I look at the best plan to join every two tables. I proceed with that. And then I find the best plan to join every three tables. I proceed with that. And then I find the best plan to join every four tables. I proceed with that. If you think about it, it's kind of like saying, what's the best strategy for you to find to get the optimal GPA out of a university? Assuming getting 4.0 is impossible, let's say you, are, you have to take a million classes. If I ask you to take two classes, you say, oh, what's the optimal? Optimal is get 4.0 at every class, then I get 4.0 overall. For two classes, four classes, even 10, maybe you are a genius, even at scale to 100 classes, you still can manage to get 4.0 GPA. But what if I ask you to take a million classes in a semester, at least I cannot do 4.0 for sure. I don't know about you, but I cannot maintain 4.0 in that case. So what's your strategy? Your strategy, what's the global optimal strategy to allocate your effort over a, hundred, a million courses to get the optimal GPA, average GPA? That obviously is NP-hard, right? Because you have to look at all the possible combinations and blah, 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 this exponential space. So instead of doing that, you, what you're saying is, OK, I'm going to come up with some random ordering of these courses. What's the best strategy to get 4.0 in each classes? That's my best one relation plan. Okay, what's the best strategy if I take only two classes? What's the best strategy to get the best GPA out of these two classes? Then I proceed in round like that. This not, of course, this does not necessarily lead you to the optimal strategy. Right? For example, you may end up with you spending a lot of effort in a simple class because you start with that as your base approach and you build your global plan out of that. That's a local optimal, but it's not going to give you the global optimal. If you look at the global one million classes, simple classes you allocate that amount of effort, for example. But if it's a local greedy algorithm, that's exactly what, you, what would you do, right? So local optimal does not necessarily lead to global optimal. That's the point. But nevertheless, Typically, local optimal will lead to a globally not so bad plan. Because if you're locally optimal at each point, globally you cannot be too bad, in some sense. Right? Globally, you cannot be too bad. So that's essentially the idea. And to be more specific, the idea is find the best one relation plan for each relation, and then find the best way to join results of each one relation plan to another relation, meaning find the best two relation plan to proceed. Uh, I'm going to give you a specific example of this, so that then there are also some notion of interesting order of the plans, which for now we're going to uh, ignore this part. I will come back to this. Interesting order of tables. So for now, let's consider at each level we just keep the cheapest plan overall. So let me give you a concrete example of this. So I will come back to the discussion on interesting model. Okay. Let's say we have a, an example like this. Suppose this is my, uh, my plan. That's essentially the, at the very beginning of the core optimization uh, uh, lecture, this is, that's the motivating example I've been using, right? the running example. And suppose these are, are my, uh, what database catalog tells me. I have a, a hash table on B plus 3, a B plus 3, a cluster of B plus 3 on BID, and uh, just a B plus 3 on SID, and I have a B plus 3 and hash index on color. 
So these are kind of the metadata information you have. So in phase one, you are looking at the best one relation plan for each relation by itself. How many relations you have? In this case? Three. You have three. So you are looking at three local plans. What's the best plan to search through both and reserve and sellers respectively? What's the best possible plan with the batch of this query for you to scan both, for you to scan the for you to scan sellers? Now, for reserve and seller, if you look at this relation, this, this query, for reserve and seller, what's the best one relation plan? There are no selection, there are nothing, so it's just a scan. If you look at this, Left deep trip, and there's no selection, nothing, so the best plan is just to what? You're not doing the join, remember? You're just looking at this branch, this branch. There's nothing there, so the best plan is simply to scan them. Right? Just scan them. What's the best relation, one relation plan for this part? There's the selection here, color becomes black. What, what would you do? Well, you can either use the B plus B or hash. Given that it's an equality condition, most likely the hash-based approach will be better. That will be most likely the best one relation plan for that. But you don't know for sure, because it really depends on the selectivity and the stat of the, on the index, right? What's the height of the tree and so on and so forth, right? Does that make sense? Whether it's a cluster index on, on color or not. So it's one of the two, either B plus B or hash. Definitely not a linear scan over both to find color to the map. Does that make sense? Yes? So without further knowledge, I don't know which one will be the best, but it's going to be one of the two. So I say B plus B or hash on um, color. That's the best one relation plan to probe into both. Yes? So why would you, I guess, when you're designing your query plan, like, I guess bother building the B plus tree or the hash, if you just care about the red ones, why not just no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand your question. So if we don't, I guess we're assuming we don't have an index on votes on color? We do, we do. That's, that's what the manager tells you, right? Oh, okay. Huh? Oh, all right. Um, okay. Also, the, oh, so we're choosing whether to use that B plus tree. Yeah, we're, ch we're choosing which one to use, but if you don't have further statistical information okay. on that, you don't know. So that's why I'm saying for our discussion, it's one of the two. I, I just show both options. Now, so now you are left with three plans to proceed to round two, to phase two, which is, what are the three plans? The first one relation plan is simply this guy. You, for step two, what's your objective? Your objective is to look at for every two relation, for every two relation, for every two of them, what's the best plan to join them? So how many uh, plans Total you are looking at six, right? So we choose two. Because there are three relations, every two of them join, so it's three, six relations you are looking at. And you select the best plan for each of these combinations. So that, what, that, what that means in the following for each of the plan in phase one, you generate plan joining another relation at dinner using all join methods. So what's the best plan to join reserve with boat? Uh, what's the best plan to join reserve with sailors? What's the best plan to join sailor with boat? Uh, what's the best plan to join sailor with reserve? So basically you're looking at all possible two relation combinations. And you select the best plan to join each of the two. And you keep that as the results of you. Phase two. Does that make sense? And uh, note that for the boats, for the color of boats, we we'll have both hash and beach. In practice, you will select just one of the two. If you from phase one, you can figure out which one is the best one to do that. You will keep just one of them. 
instead of doing both B tree and hash. Does it make sense? In our case, since we cannot determine that, we will keep both both B tree and hash on, on the current report. And for each of these, you will figure out what's the best join algorithm to use. For each of the join, you have five or six different join algorithms to use, right? So your job is reduced to, for each of these join operation, what's the best join algorithm to use? That make sense? And then for each pair of relation, you keep the cheapest plan. Note that you use, okay, if you look at what we're doing here, the best one relation plan is used as alter and the other relation being as used as inner. You never consider the swapping of the two, meaning the best one relation plan at the inner and the other one at the alter. Why is that? Because you will consider that when you come to the other relation. Because you have the best one relation plan for each relation, right? When you use each one of them as order, the other possible one as inner, sooner or later, you know, swapping the order will be considered when you come to the second relation. For example, you have A and B, <coughs> only two relations. You keep the best one relation plan for A, and then you join with B. Why don't you consider B join with best one of A? That's because you will have a best one relation of B as well. And when you consider this, you, you're gonna use this at order and A at inner. So it's effectively you consider all the possible order between any two of them. That's why for each of this, you consider only using the best one relation at order and the other relation at inner. You do not swap the order of the two because when you come to the other relation, that relation will become the alter and this relation will become the inner. That make sense? Okay, so you don't have to worry about ordering. Uh, each will come in turn. Okay, then for this is a pair of relation A and B, you keep the cheapest plan for joining A and B. Because you, can, you consider using both A as order and using both A as inner. You consider both cases right, for A and B. And this is from view phase one, by the way. Best one relation plan over B, best one relation over A. Of course, if there's another C, you will consider joining with C as well. But let's say we only have two, then you keep the best overall plan. Actually, if you don't have two relations, you are done right, at this point. So I guess does that let you, since we're doing a greedy approach to it, yes. um, can you like optimize, I guess, kind of on the fly, like execute, since we know we're going to go with A, if A is the cheapest, we can go ahead and just do that already and then no, we get more enemy is cheapest over A. Like if we since we're doing a greedy approach, don't yeah. we already know we're going if we've decided A is the first one we're gonna do, then but, we're gonna but you don't have to be greedy. too greedy, right? You don't have to be too greedy. I mean A what do you mean by A is the best one to go? I mean right. A is a A is a we keep the best one relation plan for A, it doesn't mean that will lead to the global optimal plan. Oh there are okay. two different things. Yeah. You don't want to be too, if you are too greedy, you are, you are losing opportunity to cut off really bad maps. Okay. Okay? So that's phase number two. Is this clear? What about phase number three? Do I need to continue? I don't think I need to continue, right? Phase number three is to say for each of the best two relation plan you keep for every pair of relations, note that a key observation is at the end of each phase, you do not have just one plan. It's not the best plan over any two relations. Rather, it's for every pair of relations, the best plan of joining them. There's a difference of two. If I'm saying the best plan for any two relations, you have only one plan left. What I actually said is, for every pair of relations, you find the best plan for that. Of course, Code on code, best plan, because it's not necessarily the best plan over that too, because you obtain that by looking at only the best plan for a single relation. That already is 
a, a limitation, right? You're not considering all possible combination between the two relations. You're saying, what if I'm doing the best I can do for one relation, then I join with another relation. Well, the best you can do for one relation is not, just, it's not necessarily the best you can do for joining two relations. These are two different things. But nevertheless, using that assumption, I'm giving you the best plan to join two relations for every pair of relations. Now we'll proceed with these guys to round number three. My round number three is what? For each of the plan returned from class two, I use that as alter, I join with one more relation. Then I keep the best way of joining that. I mean three relations, I find the best way to join that. Then I proceed to round four, round five, until I finish joining all relations. Is that clear? Okay, so this is a local optimal Greeley really algorithm have. The only thing I want to add to this is coming back to arguing this uh, interesting order. So for each subset of relation, we keep the cheapest plan or all, right? Meaning the, for each pair of relation, we keep the best two relation plan. For every three, we keep the best three relation plan we perceive, right? That's essentially the algorithm we talk about. But in addition to that, we also keep those plans that preserve some interesting orders. What do I mean by that? What do you mean by interesting order? For example, the best two relation plan to join, let's say, bolt and reserve, okay, is I do a best one relation plan on bolt is, let's say, hash on color on bolt. Then I do a hash join between bolt and reserve. Is that clear? And sort boy join is not as good as hash join to join the boat and reserve. So I keep only the hash join. Using this algorithm, I will keep only the hash join algorithm. I will throw away the plan using the sort word join between boat and reserve. Because for every two relation, I keep only one plan. I throw away the sort word join. Because locally, hash join is better than sort word join for those two relations. Does it make sense? But later on, when you come to the final phase of your query, you notice that the both are reserved. Let's say they are uh, must they must be joining on both ID. Suppose we're talking about natural join. That must be both ID. But later on, when you come to the final phase of your query, you realize there's a condition called group by both ID and count. What do you realize? If you realize this, that sort will join as step number two for joining these two relation might become a better option, even though locally is more expensive, slightly more expensive than hash join. But as a result of that, the resulting join condition, the resulting, sorry, the resulting join tables are sorted by both ID. Now for you to do that group by is almost no cost. You just do a linear scan, you're done. Does that make sense? If you use a hash join, yes, it helps, but you may still have clearance. You may need to do another in-memory hash table to figure out clearance and to, for you to process that group by aggregation, as we talked about before, the, the rehash phase. If you do the sorting, <coughs> it's already sorted, then you just do a linear scan, you're done. That's an example where local optimal does not necessarily lead, does not necessarily lead to global optimal. And that's, again, an example of what do I mean by interesting orders? If you have, in the intermediate process of this algorithm, for any two, this can happen for joining two relations or joining three relations and so on and so forth, right? Not only you keep the cheapest plan for joining those two or three relations, you also keep those plans that are not necessarily the cheapest one, but give you some interesting order. Interesting order such as, sorted by an attribute that later on used by another join, or sorted by an attribute later on used by group by aggregation. Does that make sense? Or partitioned by an attribute later on used by group by, or partitioned by an attribute later on used by another join condition. Okay, those are what I mean by interesting order. So for each pair, or every three, every four relations you consider, not only you keep the cheapest plan overall for them, you keep all those plans that give you some interesting elements. That's it. Okay, that's essentially the proper condition. Okay?
the next two classes we discuss this already. I want to skip this. The point is, for next two query, you optimize each block independently. Some uh, big high points, I will skip that. And I will use the remaining min, uh, time of this lecture to talk about another way to estimate selectivity, which uh, is covered in your homework as well. That will wrap up our discussion on formalization. Um, coming back on Thursday, I will start discussion on transactions. Okay, what's another way to uh, estimate uh, selectivity? Another way from mental technique is called sampling. All of you should know sampling. Okay. How many of you know sampling? No. Only two of you. <laughs> You know, that's why last year the poll was off by so much, the election. <laughs> but people don't understand what's happening. <laughs> you know, I'll give you an example. If I want to predict who's going to win a general election, I do a survey. I say I survey 2 million people. That's a lot of people you survey. I'm going to predict Hillary Clinton going to win. Sounds like a reliable source, right? But you have to look at where those two million people are coming from. If I tell you, oh, those two million people I called are all from San Francisco. Oh, if you tell me that, I will be willing to bet a billion bucks that a clear claim they're gonna win. Always. Right? Well, that's a Democrat stronghold, right? But if you tell me these two million people are randomly select over you know 50 states over a different country, then that that's a reliable uh, poll. By random sampling, the point is sampling in particular, we are talking about random sample. Random sample, the idea is very simple, is that you have a, uh, you have a set of your uh, records. Uh, so capital N is the distinct number of value you have, so I don't want to that, so let me use capital M. Because you may have duplicates, right? You may have duplicates. Yeah? M is maybe greater than or equal to that distant value of that the total number value. So a sample, a random sample Okay, for now let's assume we don't have okay, to simplify our discussion, let's assume we don't have duplicates. Let's assume we don't have duplicates. Okay? Meaning that we don't have duplicates, then we have distinct number of value n, then we have n number of records as well. Now, a random sample is simply is a subset of this. Suppose my set is my R is this. So my random sample is a subset of this. where S1, S2, and Sn is a subset of from 1 to right? it's selected from this value of 1 to n. So I'm randomly selecting. And being random sample, what that tells you is probability of any Ri is selecting to S must equal to 1. One over n. They have equal probability to be selected into uh, into the uh, into the sample set, and this choice is independent of any other choice you make. So each one of them have equal probability to be selected into the sample. Does that make sense? You may tell me. Okay. You may ask me why this is useful for selective estimation. The point is. If you have a random sample of this, selectivity estimation falls down to this, which is what's the frequency of Ri. If you can estimate this, you can estimate selectivity. Huh? Essentially, it falls down to this. What's the frequency of this? Without, of course, looking at this, the naive solution is to look at this. A linear scan R, I can get this. But obviously, that's expensive. So the point is, random sample give you a way to estimate this, which is to say that, okay, I don't know this, but I can build an estimator of this to estimate this value. 
the idea is I simply count how many records having this value in my sample set. Number of records of frequency of value x. Number of records in s equal to x. So I simply do this and scale by my sampling probability. Scale by my sampling probability. Know that each of them has a oh, sorry, each of them has a sampling uh, one over n, but my sample size is n, so the sampling probability is small n over n. Each of them has a one over n probability to be selected, but you are selecting n samples, so the sampling probability is small n over n. So I use this scale by I define this as rho my sampling probability. I scale this by rho. I claim this is a good estimation. For in fact, you can show that this is an unbiased estimator. So this unbiased estimator means that the expectation of this estimation will equal to this. So this brings up the question of what is expectation for a random variable? And someone pointed out, what's the expectation for a random variable? Not, not, the mean, not the mean, it's the expectation of random variable equal to the value, the possible values they may take times the probability x equal to that value of x. That's the expectation. So what this says is if you write this formula out, this is a, a random variable because you're making random choice. Who are in this random set? It's random choice. Over all the possible random choice you have on uh, expectation, this is equal to you, uh, the value you're trying to ask. I will give you more detail on this on coming back on Thursday, but that's just give you kind of idea of why random sample will be made of estimating selectivity. Okay? Alright, see you on Thursday.